So your TA Indiana is super hyper right now. He actually loves heat exchanger problems for some crazy reason. But this problem is kind of a good one because heat exchangers, double pipe heat exchangers in parallel versus counter flow, it seems like the counter flow should be way better. But actually in this problem, you'll see that sometimes they end up being only just a little bit better. So the figure on the screen is for a counter flow double pipe heat exchanger. This means that we've got our cold fluid flowing through a pipe and then outside that pipe is a second pipe where we have steam basically flowing in a ring around the water and the water and the steam are flowing in opposite directions, that is counter flow. Now, if this were opposite, if the steam and water were both entering the same side and going in the same direction, that would be parallel flow. And in parallel flow, the steam enters really hot, water enters really cold, and as they go through the heat exchanger, the steam gets colder, the water gets warmer, and the best possible end state has them at the same temperature. The steam can never get colder than the water, and the water can never get hotter than the steam. And so, there's sort of a, a limited upside to how good a parallel flow heat exchanger can be because those exit temperatures can never cross. But now consider a counter flow heat exchanger. You have cold water entering one side, hot steam entering the other side. The longer the heat exchanger is, the more the steam can cool off and it only needs to be at the exit of steam warmer than the inlet of the water. And as the water heats up, as it goes across, it can never exceed the inlet temperature of the steam. However, as these two sort of flows are passing each other, it is possible for the outlet flow of the water to be warmer than the outlet flow of the steam. That is actually possible as the water heats up and the steam cools down because you have the really hottest part of the steam at the same place where the hottest part of the water is and the coldest steam near the coldest water. And so this is why you can sometimes get more efficient uh, heat exchange out of a counterflow heat exchanger. All right, so this is a crazy long problem. So first we just gotta really dive into the actual text here and try to figure out what even, <laughs> just try to pull out all of our, our givens. So we've got a mass flow rate of water, we're given the rate of heat transfer from the cold water to the pipe, and then the other rate of heat transfer, right, the, the heat transfer coefficient uh, to the steam, right, these 1250 and 850. So for the steam, we're given the inlet temperatures on the picture, 250. We're given that there's a drop in temperature of 70. So remember that the outlet temperature is 180, not 70. That's probably a common mistake that students might make right off the bat. Uh, we're given Exit temperature of water getting up to 70 degrees Celsius. Now this actually is the outlet temperature. It's not a change in temperature. Let's see, we're trying to find heat transfer area. So this is gonna be the surface area is one of the final answers. And we're interested both in counter flow, which is how the drawing is drawn, and also, what if it were in parallel flow? What would, how much area would we need? How much bigger would we have to make it if this were in parallel flow instead of counter flow? There are two main methods to solve heat transfer problems. That is LMTD, the log mean temperature difference, or NTU, net thermal units. This is gonna be an LMTD problem because the exit temperatures are known. If we did not know exit temperatures, you would call this an NTU problem and take a totally different path. So usually for assumptions, I'm just filling these in as I solve the problem. Each time I make an assumption, I write it down, but there's actually some information given in the problem that I haven't counted for yet, and that is fouling. That is over time due to impurities in the water, like just buildup of gunk, um, you get fouling on the pipe, which reduces heat transfer efficiency. It says just use an appropriate value. So I'm just gonna pull up a table here from the textbook and grab R equals 0 0.00015. And this will be meters squared Kelvin per watts. And that's only on the inside. I'll use fouling a zero on the outside of the pipe. 
And then we were also told that the pipe is of negligible thickness. So that's gonna let me assume that the surface area on the inside and outside of the pipes are gonna be the same and that they're both at the same diameter. So when it comes to calculating surface areas, I don't have to calculate an inner surface area and an outer surface area. They're both gonna be the same. Right. And of course, as always happens, your TA was here with us just as we were starting the problem, but now that we're trying to solve it right when we really need him, he's just gone off to, I don't know, take care of his other kitty business. So we're on our own. We've got two equations for heat transfer, so let's start there. Q is equal to m dot Cp delta T. This equation is used for an individual stream of liquid. So the delta T would be like the inlet versus outlet of water. Or if we wanted to do the steam, we could just do the steam inlet to outlet, right? This m dot Cp delta T is just for one stream, but you could use it for either stream. The other equation, Q equals Ua delta T, that is for the heat transfer between the two streams of liquid. And this delta T L M is actually gonna be a function of all four temperatures, both inlets and both outlets. And if we just figure out what's given, what we know, we know mass flow rate for the cold water, we can look up CP and we know both temperatures. We know inlet and outlet, so we should be able to find Q for the water. And Q for the water, the amount of heat lost by the steam is equal to the amount of heat gained by the water, which is also equal to the amount of heat exchanged between the two. And that just requires us to make an assumption that this is well insulated, that no heat is lost out to the atmosphere. So all the heat lost by the steam goes into the water. None of it is lost to the atmosphere. And another assumption is that let's assume that CP is constant. Now, technically, as water changes temperature, its CP will also change but not by very much. So let's just look up a single value for CP and just kind of go with it. So we're gonna keep a single value of 4182 joules per kilogram Kelvin. And just write that as an assumption, just assume that it's constant. And so my equation for rate of heat gained by the water is the mass flow rate 3.47 times CP 4182 times delta T for just the water, 70 minus 30. And as I check my units, Kelvin cancels, kilogram cancels. I've left with joules per second, which is watts. So 580,500 watts or 580.5 kilowatts. is the amount of heat, the amount of energy gained by the cold water from the steam. Your TA and he came back. He didn't abandon us after all. He's here right when we need him for finding the overall heat transfer coefficient U. So this is gonna be similar to a thermal resistance, those sort of like circuit equations you did at the very beginning of the course. So one over UA is equal to, so we've got five different stages, sort of different steps of resistances. We've got from the cold water to the fouling, then we've got through the fouling inside the pipe, then through the pipe itself, that's the natural log in the middle, that's the conduction through the pipe, then we've got uh, through the fouling on the outside of the pipe, and then another one over HA term from the outside of the outer fouling to the steam. So if we combine these five different thermal resistances, the nice thing about the assumption we made about the really thin pipe, the negligible thickness, is all of these area terms cancel out. We also have the, the center term, the conduction through the pipe with the natural log, that's also gonna cancel out. So we're really just left with two one over H terms on the inside and outside, and then the R term for the fouling. Again, that's the all the buildup of gunk on the inside of the pipe. So one over 1250 plus 0 0.00015 plus one over 850, one divided by all of that, that gets us a U, an overall heat transfer coefficient of 470 watts per meter squared Kelvin. Thank you, TA Indy, you're a big help. So we found Q, we found U, the final answer we're looking for is A. The only thing left is delta T L M, log mean temperature difference. And now there's gonna be two different equations we're gonna use for this, one for counterflow, one for 
parallel flow. And the equations look almost the same at a glance until you realize that the, the O's and the I's are kind of switched around a little bit. Basically, each of these pairs of temperatures are the temperatures that are right next to each other in the actual physical machine. So for the counter flow double pipe heat exchanger, the cold inlet is next to the hot outlet. So THO minus TCI, since those are the two temperatures right next to each other. Then the cold outlet is next to the hot inlet. So THI minus TCO. So we plug in all of our temperatures here, 180 minus 30 and 250 minus 70, and we get a delta T LM of 164.5 degrees Celsius. And to check whether this answer makes sense, we compare against the two delta T's. So 180 minus 30 is 150. So delta T at the cold inlet is 150, but then 250 minus 70 is 180. So the delta T at the outlet is 180. So delta T LM has to be in between those two values. It has to be in between 150 and 180 and will probably be approximately in the middle. It doesn't have to be exactly in the middle, but should be approximately there within a couple degrees. So 150 to 180, you expect it to be in the middle around 165. So 164.5 sounds perfect. Now, if this heat exchanger were actually parallel flow, then we would have the hot and cold inlets right next to each other and the hot and cold outlets right next to each other. So in the equation, we now see T hot out and T cold out next to each other, T hot in, T cold in next to each other. So 180 minus 70 is 110, 250 minus 30 is 220. So we've got a much bigger difference in between these. We get a delta T LM of 158 degrees, which uh, is in between the two. So exactly halfway in between, 220 plus 110 would be 330, divided by two would be also 165. So again, it should be around 165, but again, it doesn't have to be exactly the same. So 158 is close enough. This looks like we, we didn't make a huge mistake here. So we have all pieces now for the rate of heat transfer equation. We've got our Q dot 580,000, the U overall heat transfer coefficient 470. We're looking for surface area as a final answer. And then for counter flow, 164.5 degrees is our Delta T LM. This gives us a surface area of 7.50 meters squared for the counterflow double pipe heat exchanger solved with the log mean temperature difference. So if this heat exchanger were actually doing parallel flow, we still have the same rate of heat transfer, the same overall heat transfer coefficient, but a different temperature, 158.7. So the log mean temperature difference is actually a little bit smaller. This gets us to a surface area that's a little bit larger 7.78 meters squared, but that's actually not that much larger. You might have been expecting a much bigger difference. It seems like counter flow should be way better than parallel flow, but in this case, it's only about 4% better, 3.7% better. The parallel flow heat exchanger has to be 3.7% larger to get the same amount of heat transfer as the counter flow heat exchanger. <laughs> Sorry, your TA Andy doesn't jump so good. That's why I'm trying to keep my hands on him nowadays. He's getting kind of old. And so I don't want him jumping all the way down to the ground from the table um, without some, <laughs> without a little bit of a boost. <laughs> But hey, he was a trooper. He stuck with us like almost the whole problem. So if you think your TA Indy did a good job, go ahead and hit the thumbs up button to, to let him know that you really appreciate it, um, that, he, that he was here helping us out. And if you're ready for another heat transfer problem right now, more practice exercise, you're in the groove, then click on the video right here. It's another LMTD practice problem. This one though is for a shell and tube heat exchanger where you're gonna have to use a correction factor F instead of just a regular LMTD.